Hello, Mount Sinai, uh, and to all of you who are listening in, I am so happy that you've chosen to join us again today, and I pray that something will be said or something will be uh, done to enlighten you and to give you strength for the weeks, months, even years to come. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, as we come again to study your word, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive you afresh. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So once again, we are on article number 11, the perseverance of saints. And our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure unto the end that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And our main scripture continues to be John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32, which reads, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And our focus, once again, continues to be on the latter part of verse 32, and the truth will set you free. And today we will continue with our third declaration of freedom, which is freedom from discouragement, no frustration which is found in Romans the 8th chapter, verses 8, 18 through 30. And again today, I'll read the verses 18 through 22 out of the NIV. Verse 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, but not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And so Paul, in the entirety of our verses, speaks of suffering and of groaning. I like how Paul sets up uh, for his discussion on suffering. He transitions into it making it a natural part of the conversation. Uh, the previous verses, verse 16 and 17 says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. So first of all, he confirms that we have the Holy Spirit in us uh, that testifies with our spirit that we belong to God. And then he layers it on, uh, he layers on to that by stating that since we are children, that makes us heirs. So far, so good. We all get that. Humanly speaking, in, in its simplest terms, if my father is rich when, I, when he dies, I'm, at, I'm his heir, then I'm rich. And we all get that. And we all like that. It's the if and, and, and what comes after it that messes us up. It says, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So back to the rich father example. We like being a part of the family that is rich. But as children of the family, 
we are required to learn the family business from the ground up, not from the top down. You don't start out with the corner office and the company car. You start out cleaning the toilets and rolling the mail cart. Paul is saying that the family business involves suffering. He, he says that suffering is a prerequisite for entering into the full benefits of sonship. In, in other words, suffering comes before glory. That's where a lot of folk uh, put on the brakes. We, we kind of said, wait, 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 I didn't sign up for that. I, I thought being a Christian meant the end of suffering, not the beginning of suffering. We have this misconceived notion that Christianity is supposed to get me out of suffering. But Paul says, not so. Suffering is a reality of Christian li living. But we are not left to do it on our own. We have the Holy Spirit as our helper. Suffering peels back all of the stuff that we take on as feel-good religious nothings that sound good and, and make us feel good. Suffering is, is pretty much where the rubber meets the road. Uh, some years ago, I learned the difference between a luxury car and a not-so-luxury car. I, I was looking for a small, inexpensive car. I, I just wanted a basic car that would get me from point A to point B. I didn't care about the bells and the whistles. I, I wanted good mileage. So, I test drove a Toyota Echo. I know some of you are like, oh, what? But the Toyota Echo. And immediately, I noticed the f what the feel of the road meant. I, I could literally feel the road, which at first, I thought was great. It, it gave me the feeling that I was in charge. I, I like the feeling, uh, I like feeling the turns and feeling the power of guiding the steering wheel. I was in love with that little car. But then I drove on a street that wasn't so smooth. This street had bumps and it had holes. And then I experienced the true meaning of the rubber hit the road or the feel of the road. It's when all of the mechanics of luxury is left off and it's just you and the road. I learned that I was not up for the experience. I liked more of a smooth riding experience. And that's how we are as Christians. We like the smooth experiences of life. That is what we all choose, but that is not the choice, but that's not our choice to make. Adam, in the Garden of Eden, made a choice that has impacted all of us. As the first man, he chose for us, and he passed that gene along to all of humanity. We get that, and if you don't get that, look in the mirror. Those characteristics that you like or you don't like about yourself, that, that you had nothing to do with because it was inherited. You might be able to conceal it, those that you don't like, by doing a little this, a little that, but the reality is it's yours and you will pass it on to your children. God placed Adam in, and Eve in a perfect garden in his perfect creation. He gave one command that was to be kept. God starts his command by saying, you are free to partake of any tree in this garden of beauty. But there's one, just one restriction, one tree out of the many that you may not eat from. 
the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Two trees planted by God in the midst of paradise, each with a universal path, one for life and the other with a path that included death. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Since we all know the story, we can fast forward. We don't have to go through the details. We can fast forward to after they disobeyed God and ate from the of the forbidden fruit or the forbidden you know, the forbidden tree. Immediately their eyes were open, and the first thing they realized is that they were naked. And then they tried to sow fig leaves together to solve their problem. And here we get a, a glimpse of the progressive nature of sin. Next, God shows up and questioned them about eating of the forbidden tree, uh, to which they played the blame game. The man pretty much blames God for his disobedience. Because after all, if God had not put the woman there in the first place, he would not have eaten from the tree because the woman would not have been there to give it to him. And, and so after being ratted out by Adam, the woman blames the serpent. She says, the serpent deceived me and I did eat. Now, According to 1 Timothy 2 and 14, she was really telling the truth. The serpent did deceive her. Of course, that doesn't make her less guilty. She knew what the command was. But it also meant that if she was deceived, then Adam sinned willfully with his eyes wide open. He knew he was disobeying God's command but did it anyway. Notice how God does not even question the serpent as to his part in the whole thing. In my mind, I see the serpent, also known as the devil or the deceiver or roaring lion, lion who devours. He, he was just like doing what he do. And, you know, I can see him say, hey, I was just doing what I do. Jesus calls Satan a murderer and the father of lies. In my mind, I see the serpent. Uh, I, I see him with that stupid, I got you grin. When, when you're dealing with a liar, you do best not to even engage with him. So God proceeded to hand out the punishments for each. First to the serpent because it had been used by Satan. It, it seems safe to assume that at one time, the serpent was upright because of its curse. God said, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Then God spoke directly to Satan. He says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is the first gospel because it, this is the first announcement of the coming redeemer found in the Bible. This verse is humanity's hope. To Satan, it was God's declaration of war that will end with him being condemned. And it was also assurance to the woman that God will use a woman to bring the Redeemer into the world. That is God showing us grace. That we won't be in this predicament forever. One other thing that I get from the verse is that not only will the woman have offsprings, but also Satan. And the two offsprings will grow together until Jesus returns to do the separating. Then God turns to the woman. 
and he says, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to your children. Your desire will be to your husband and he will rule over you. This verse is just jam packed. It is a packed verse, but it's not for this lesson. It's for another lesson. But I will point out the obvious. Any lady that has had a baby knows that the pain is great. Even if you're one of those that was put to sleep, you woke up to pain. You just because you went to you you were asleep during the the birthing, you did not get rid of uh, surpass the pain. Pain is definitely a part of childbearing, and in the birth process. Then also, this verse puts into motion the battle of the sexes, and, and uh, to quote Forrest Gump, that's all I got to say about that. So then God turns to Adam and God says, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat food until you are returned, until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, from the dust you are, and to the dust you will return. So God cursed the serpent and he cursed the ground, but he did not curse Adam and Eve. Eve would have pain in childbirth. And Adam would have pain in his daily toils to get food. Now the work would require sweat. The ground would produce thorns and thistles. Every day would be a reminder of how good he used to have it. And, one, and that one day he would return to the very ground that he was working. Adam made a choice. He made the wrong choice and suffering and death in it, into the world because of the choice that he made. And it will be with us until Jesus returns. A fact that jumps out at me is that sin doesn't just affect the one who sinned. It affects whole families, whole neighborhoods. It affects whole congregations. And in Adam's case, the whole world, even creation. Paul says in verse 20 of Romans the eighth chapter, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to the decay bondage to decay and brought into glorious freedom of the children of God. Let me say that again. And brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. So creation got thrown into frustration, not by any fault of his own. It did not do anything to cause itself to suffer. But loved ones that is the nature of sin that's all for today join us next week as we continue exploring the freedoms we have as god's children let us pray father we thank you for this day we thank you for your word we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds so that we can know what it is that you are saying to us. And Father, we once we hear you, help us to do what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us and goodbye for now. And hopefully I'll see you again next week.